call from Senator D. Crane. He had to go to, he's out of state right now. Also a call from Senator Stewart. He had a, he got sick, so he had to go to the VA as well. So we'll continue on, we have a quorum, so we'll go on. But uh, at this time, we'll call for invocation. And I'll ask. Senator Stewart, to give us our opening invocation. Oh, y'all just pray with me. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we give you praise and glory, Lord, and we ask you to go before us, Lord Jesus, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be with each and every one of us, Lord, in, this, in our nation, Lord. Watch over everyone's family, Lord Jesus, Lord, watch over our our government, Lord Jesus, Lord, watch over everybody that's coming to and fro from work, Lord. Lord, we praise you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to go before us and open up them doors, Lord, for us, Lord. Lord, we praise you. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, 150, I have roll call, starting with Senator Two 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 Lincoln's Black Lodge. Thirty-eight Black Lodge. Stuart Black Lodge. Other Miss Reno. Kyle Gresh Reno. Not afraid, Oscar Jake Chen. Covered up a lot, Gresh. Alden Bigger. Not afraid, Big One. Goes ahead, a little dodge on. Cove Zero Creek. Back one mighty few. Old crew, Oscar Jake Chen. Shane Reno. We have 15 senators present. We had left off last week with the uh, completing new business, and then that brings us back to the top of the agenda, which is reports. We start out with legislative branch reports, but at this time, for organized Senator Stewart. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Secretary, Tribal Secretary, and Mr. Chairman, and all the cabinet heads and guests, members. At this time, I want to make a motion to to amend the agenda to bring the executive reports to the forefront, and then push the committee reports to the end of the agenda. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Second. To amend the agenda to have, allow executive to give their reports at this time this afternoon and moving legislative branch to the, the end of session. We have a second by Senator Goes ahead. Question. Question by Senator Not Afraid. All those in favor of the motion to amend the agenda at this time, raise your right hand. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Motion to amend the agenda passes with a vote of 15 yes, zero no, zero abstain. So at this time, this will bring us to the executive branch reports. Starting off with the chairman of the executive branch, Chairman Darren O'Coyote, organizes Chairman O'Coyote. I believe uh, the chairman's getting copies of the report, his report, at this time. So, <coughs> just wait a couple of minutes while they come to the floor now. So, uh, go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, the handout you'll see the uh, right now. What currently what we're working on um, is the native days. Uh, the dates have been set for native days. Uh, the budget is a draft of a budget being handed out. Um, the coordinators different uh, events and this year we're gonna have a um, special award for uh, World War II veterans uh, I believe there's um, less than uh, half a dozen left of our World War II veterans so we want to uh, honor those uh, veterans um, and there's 
uh, last year, I believe there was a World War II Crow uh, co-talkers that were honored. There was two. Um, actually, there was four, and the other two were honored in D.C. back in uh, 1998. And so we want to do a working on uh, coins for these World War II co Crow talkers, I guess you call them Crow co talkers. Um, the concessions, the Veterans Park program, the youth rodeo, the trail ride, Indian relay, horse racing, it's all, all the budget is a uh, draft. And then the schedule is uh, attached as well. And this year we're, uh, <clears throat> there's about three tour rodeos going on at the same time as Native Days. And so they've, uh, the rodeo coordinator has asked to have a PRC rodeo Friday and Saturday and then the Crawl Crow rodeo on Sunday. So that's the proposal from the um, rodeo manager who's uh, Cotton Realbird. And then uh, the Indian Relay, we're bringing in a professional Indian um, Horse Racing Association um, and Kendo's been uh, heading that up, and they want to kind of pursue the the same concept as the PBR, and they have four dates available or four race meets that have committed to uh, the professional Indian relay, and in in this we're given uh, ten thousand, but these are uh, this is a, a schedule and it's just for uh, for. Uh, information, but at the same time, we want to have a, a Wednesday and Thursday um, a Native Days week. We want to sponsor a coal summit to invite all the Northwest tribes uh, to kind of showcase um, how important coal is to the Crow tribe and to you know uh, show these uh, Northwest tribes that how much uh, dependence we have on coal development here uh, uh, among the Crow people. And so Wednesday and Thursday will be a coal summit. And <clears throat> at about the same time uh, that Thursday after the, or Wednesday after the trail ride, we want to dedicate the, the park out in front here. Um, and I think uh, Sean uh, Backbone, the Vice Secretary has also um, has an announcement, but he's busy with the uh, Department of Transportation right now with a meeting they have with the state. So uh, he could go into detail on the, the flag raising and uh, the park project. So, but that's uh, Native Days. And then you have the uh, 1.5 um, line of credit that we talked about. In here, I put the general fund drawdowns revenue schedule. And from December to uh, June, there's no drawdowns, maybe uh, 900,000 at the most. And a lot of the federal programs we have to carry through this time. And then uh, the general fund, there's no drawdowns. So a lot, a lot of our um, funding isn't coming in uh, from December to June under the general fund. So um, I have that attached in here, all the drawdowns from OST. This is from the severance tax and the Westmoreland Revenue uh, Conical Settlement. They're all included. Um, and that's why the 1.5 line of credit to carry the not only the general fund, but also the um, federal programs to carry them through this uh, five, five to six month period to uh, get them through that uh, five month period. And then I have the Cabell land buyback and all of you are well aware that the Crow tribe is number four uh, most fractionated um, of all the Indian tribes. And according to the BIA's uh, uh, records, they're saying that um, about 103 million will be coming to the Crow tribe to, to purchase uh, um, fractionated lands, but we still have not heard the exact numbers, but those are some figures that they came up with uh, back in February when we visited DC and this was at the, the COPE meeting when we got a lot of more information and then uh, and AJ can allude to that uh, we attended another COPE meeting uh, back in March so with that we'll but the Rocky Mountain that's um, just the numbers from the Cabell land buyback 
and I've been uh, appointed by um, the Montana Wyoming Tribal Leaders as uh, um, <coughs> working on a budget for uh, IHS. And I just showed this graph. I think I've co made copies before um, on IHS and where we stand in, in the whole uh, health and human services. Medicare gets 11 billion. National Health, uh, that's like the, the main headquarters, gets six billion. Veterans Administration gets six billion. Medicaid gets five billion. The federal employees get four billion. Medical for prisoners get three billion. Overall, Indian Health Service gets two billion. And that's going to be cut by five percent. Um, and so that's just to show that you know where we stand in the. Health and Human Services, and then the next one is uh, BIA's calculation of unemployment rate for Montenegro reservations. <coughs> That's just for, for your information. Uh, you probably get asked, uh, what's the unemployment rate of the Crow Tribe right now? According to this, is 47% uh, unemployment. Um, and the number is actually today, we got the number, it's uh, 13,200. Tribal enrollment today, as of today, thirteen thousand two hundred and sixty. <coughs> and then uh, on Friday, I uh, handed out, uh, and you should have got it on your um, <coughs> on your desk. It's a, a Crow Nation Hairpin Ranch um, operational plan. It's just a draft to kind of a talking discussion. Um, but it's in this. Uh, this booklet here, Hairpin Ranch. And it's just for uh, discussion, and uh, on the 30th, we're gonna have a, a kind of a barbecue get together, and I do have the key with me. Uh, the title was signed, and I left a copy of the title with uh, Jay, you call him Legal Jay. Uh, he has the, the key, or the, the, the copy of the title, and we have the key, so we're, we're uh, gonna do an inventory with BIA, and start the process for uh, feed of trust. And also on, what was it, Thursday, when Fender came in. Um, I know a lot of you have been kind of wondering where we've been with the, the C store, the uh, convenience store idea. Well, last Thursday, as you all know, I, I, I gave you a report um, a while back that Chad Fenner, who owns the Yellowtown Market in Fort Smith, wanted 1.2 um, for the convenience store. Uh, after analysis done by um, Paul Gassmeyer, the store actually um, is priced based on the analysis, uh, all the uh, income tax, uh, all the reports done to the state to um, store is actually worth three hundred fifty thousand. That's if you without the, a manager in place, and that's the offer I made to him, and he, uh, he damn near cried. But you know, um, three hundred fifty thousand from one point two, we brought him down to three hundred fifty thousand, and that's without a manager. If you hire or with the manager, if you don't hire a manager to run the place, it's uh, about five sixty. So our uh, negotiating price is around 500000 That's what we're shooting for. And he's been negotiating against himself for the last week. Um, he went from he went from 1.2 to 900 to 800. Now we're at 625. So um, we're still going to get him below that um, 500. Uh, that was last Friday when he called us uh, 625. Uh, he does have a lien or a debt of 118,000. So the offer we made back to him was we'll give him the 350 for the buildings and the the, uh, the site, and then pay off his debt, which would be still under 500,000. So that's the offer we made him, and we haven't heard back. So that's the analysis from uh, the C stores, and along the same uh, line, we've. Uh, and some of you were involved in uh, talking to the store in, uh, in prior 
to see if they're willing to sell, and I think they uh, were surprised that we even offered them. Um, but uh, that was just to, to let them know that we're interested. Um, but here's a letter from the prior public school that's uh, giving us the Crow Tribe, the land that's held in trust right next to their entrance. Uh, and it's, all of you know, right at the T, and it's a prime location, and people have always probably thought, you know, that'd be a good place for a store while well, I have in my hand a letter from the prior public school that gives us that land so we could pursue, uh, you know, building a, a store that, you know, they've, they've always wanted there, and people have always asked for it. It's more of a, a need, necessity. It's not gonna be a, a huge money maker, but it's gonna be a need for that community. And then uh, the analysis done on um, Yellowtown Market kind of gives us a, an idea of what we're looking for in each community for as far as sea stores. And um, I believe uh, right now the next step is uh, building the incorporation, the corporation articles of incorporation to establish the separate arm of the of the government where we separate business from politics and uh, pursue these uh, economic. Um, ventures and uh, but with that we thank you and uh, and the remaining balance from the 1.5 that was uh, loaned for the Hairpin Ranch we're, we're going to use that for the upgrades and to fix the place and uh, so that that money will be uh, we're doing some uh, work on it now <coughs> after the inventory we'll continue doing the repairs and and then uh, look, look uh, closely at this operational plan uh, as a consorted effort. I think we should sit down and put a good plan in place for sort of the, uh, do, I think Dookie called it the Arrow Creek Butte Ranch. So that's, uh, and, uh, that's another thing we've, um, we're uh, asking people to submit, you know, uh, what they th think the ranch should be called. But there is a, uh, in the door arena, RV hookups, um, two A-frame houses, one with about eight bedrooms in there. Um, so it could be used as, you know, uh, in the operational plan, I put just a kind of a retreat, boot ranch, Buffalo Care Center. Um, so it's, I think we owe like nine, 980,000 for to make our money back, you know, I'd like to uh, use it for uh, business ventures. So with that, I thank you, and um, we'll have uh, give you more good reports as we go along. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the chairman at this time? Before organize Senator Hugs. Thank you, Speaker. Secretary. Um, Darren. And is a um, need of his horseshoes. Um, <clears throat> he was slew with Chino Jay horseshoes with Dagaza Jerry, you know, young as I did. Like the chair, so. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. We, we have a budget of uh, 115000 if um, <coughs> We don't get the uh, ultimate warrior if casino picks up most of that, but it'll free up a lot of the budget. So um, arrow throwing and horseshoe, um, unless you guys want to sponsor it. The <laughs> <laughs> recognizes Senator Stewart. <clears throat> I'll just make my question um, brief. I just wanted to make a suggestion that maybe it's a possibility we'll go ahead and throw the um, Okabama Marina contract in there too, because it's going to be up this year. And right now, I believe um, Jack Joyce got that one. And if the tribe was to look at that, or that'd be a good place to where we can get our um, college students, you know, give them something to do during the summertime, because there's a lot of work over there to be done. And it's a revenue catcher right there. I know there was plans. Um, a while back concerning that, you know, we have riverboat and stuff like that, and I believe um, 
Chairman Okow was involved in those conversations at that time, and there was um, studies made, and it looked like a good um, venture. So I just want to make that as a suggestion to the executive branch that we could look at negotiating for that for that business. All right, for organizers, Chairman Okow. The contract, uh, we have the, the right, the, the first refusal basically to pro-tribe. Um, it would be a good, you know, uh, economic development kind of a business venture. And uh, I was just telling AJ, we could even put machines in there whereas Mr. Joyce can't. So it's a good possibility and we can move forward uh, because uh, too many years have gone by where pro-tribe has let millions go by. And right now, any, any opportunity we have, I think we should take it. Thank you, Chairman. If there are no more questions for the Chairman, we will move on to next representing the Executive Branch is Secretary A.J. Notterfried for organizers. Mr. Notterfried. Thank you, Speaker, Secretary, Legislative Body, guests, the Executive. I'll be short and sweet here. <coughs> Uh, Secretary's office has to report uh, based on elections, elections and various other constitutional duties. Uh, I want to start with elections only because we are now gearing up for this fall's uh, session of elections. Uh, currently, we continue to, or we are going to continue the same process as, as so as the uh, latest election with the special. Although the regulations within the, um, uh, the pamphlet, the um, oh, ordinance, right? We are now following the uh, special elections, being that it's not, not a special election. Uh, second, uh, we don't know if we have time to include our, we were hoping to have some uh, new uh, counting machines being that they would still be filled out manually, uh, so that wouldn't constitute as an electronic voting system, being that they're paper-based, uh, and it's just that the machine counts it electronically. Uh, so that's still in discussion, that's kind of in the forefront. Uh, I, I would like to amend the ordinance if we do take that route, uh, just based on you know various uh, uh, complications that it might, might uh, that we might uh, end up having to jump over. So next is, um, I guess within house, I've been working collectively with enrollment. Uh, we are trying to update the enrollment ordinance. Uh, we've had some complications with per capita payments only because our finance system uh, was generated by the previous administration's IT folks. So we have to bandit quite a, quite a few things, uh, and we want to apologize to the Crow people uh, who did not receive their per capita checks. Uh, so as we're still in the the working process of correcting these things, we're also uh, suggesting to the chairman that we need a whole new computer system for uh, uh, enrollment for per capita reasons and for election reasons. We would like to merge those programs. Because all, all your key, the key or the vital thing to it is Crow membership. And elections deal with Crow membership, per capita deals with Crow membership, uh, and then down to uh, even having district representation. Uh, so this computer system would keep us up to date. So when an individual comes to vote or comes to collect the per capita check, uh, we have. Uh, an available system that can give us feedback on the spot rather than having to sift through old records rather than trying to uh, relocate from a whole other whether it be archives or another department that has those records so we'd like to compile and have like a clearing agency of membership uh, next uh, I've been working with uh, our LLC director uh, receiver Seaver La Forge on uh, small business. We're still promoting small business. We're still promoting uh, entrepreneurs to come in and create their own jobs, create their own businesses. 
along those lines, we're also working on nonprofit codes uh, so that uh, various entities can receive these uh, certi certifications for funding purposes, being that they are nonprofit. Um, we also are working with the state to merge those systems. That way, when a Crow does file with the Crow tribe, they don't have to do an additional process to file with the state of Montana. <coughs> because when they file with the state of Montana, that's an additional cost. And we told the Secretary of State that uh, we feel that a lot of our entrepreneurs on the Crow Reservation site who do work in Billings or, or anywhere else within the state of Montana are being discriminated against because the state of Montana does not recognize their LLCs, yet they have to pay another, another uh, filing fee to be recognized off reservation. And us as a nation, we want to work with the state as to merging that system where uh, Crow, example, Crow Drywaller, or Crow Company who does drywall work, they work on the reservation. After a while, they cannot compete because uh, we only have so much work out there. Yet, they have enough skills to work in Hardin to hang drywall. So when it comes time for a background of that individual as an entrepreneur or a small business, uh, they, they don't get the props that they should because they ain't, they ain't registered in the state of Montana. So again, we're just trying to merge those systems. At, uh, and how we would do that is um, through, through <coughs> cost of fees, because basically that's what it boils down to when the state, when you file with the state, they have the same system that we do, where we collect the fee, and then we do a, a background check and so forth, and uh, there's a criteria to owning a business. And when you apply for a contract, <clears throat> those contracts would request if you're a qualified individual, if you do have the staff that uh, can carry out with these projects, such as engineers, um, uh, planners, uh, anybody who, a uh, uh, certified electrician, so forth. Uh, next, uh, land, we, I'm working closely with the uh, land management department. We're still uh, promulgating with the assistance with the Natural Resource Committee and Land Surface Committee uh, on uh, regulations or uh, an ordinance or a bill for the acquisition and disposal program of our tribal lands, whether it be anything from land exchange to an individual selling to the tribe or home sites, so forth. Uh, and then also lease amendments to the current agriculture lease uh, land use bill. Uh, we're also, in that, in that same realm, uh, our natural resource staff designed the management plan for the current purchase, which uh, I believe the cabinet member, if he's here, he can elaborate more, Mr. Herrera. Uh, moving on to the next uh, housing, uh, hopefully I'm working <coughs> diligently with my cabinet, uh, Mr. Carl Littleall, uh, in support of the HIP programs, HUD programs, and Good Earth Lodges. I'll start with the Good Earth Lodges. Uh, I'll be real brief, and then Carl could probably be a little more uh, uh, detailed. Within the uh, Good Earth Lodges, it's still, still a goal. We're looking at uh, purchasing <coughs> some new uh, equipment to create the blocks uh, as well as uh, made possibly a new design for these homes. Uh, we have, okay, within the HIP program that still continues on. Uh, currently, I believe they're uh, doing ramps for elderly and handicapped. Uh, HUD, again, the cabinet, Mr. Carl Lewall can explain or elaborate more on that. Uh, as, as for myself, the cabinet, and uh, Senator Stewart, we were trying to work together as a team to update the ordinance because the ordinance relies heavily on the old constitution. I mean, it's mainly titled right up front. Uh, it, compri it complies with the 48th constitution. Next, um, and this is the chairman, uh, uh, just to reiterate, we, the today, uh, the chairman is still updating his uh, selections for the various committees and, and uh, boards. Uh, so that's still in process. Um, as we are going through our folks, we're, we are trying to have among the officials, um, and, and I, I applaud the chairman for this, for bringing us in on it, is 
he says, who would make a good cabinet, or not cabinet, who would make a good board member for this, or this, or this? And so we, we set a criteria instead of appointing, say, uh, an individual who has a hard time reading. Because um, we do have um, some things that require quite a bit of reading, whether it's an ordinance or a bill or a law or what have you. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk a little about the cult. The cult uh, comprises of large land-based tribes who own at least a minimum of a thousand acres. That thousand acres are considered trust or fee, which the reservation uh, encompasses. The cult is owned by the Mandan or Hadatsa Rikara tribe uh, through the um, charter. Uh, we became a, a player uh, upon the approval of uh, Chairman Oka. Uh, in there, uh, I, I can report this, the concerns, the problems that they have in these lar large land-based tribes is pretty much identical to the Crow. And the difference between the cult program or the cult organization and say NA, uh, the National Indians of Congress Association, the, the difference there is uh, we are a part of that as well, but we're not as instrumental because that's mainly, uh, I, I would say, uh, run by uh, casino tribes, which over here at the large land base, these are tribes utilizing their natural resources. The last thing I met with on Colt was in Phoenix, and the uh, meeting comprised of the, the BIA working on agreements, and the agreements pertain to the Cobell land buyback. The Cobell land, land buyback uh, is administered through the BIA, and the BIA wants the tribes to submit some sort of agreement for how the tribes want to be, how, how the tribes want to play a part in this land buyback system. So the cult took it upon themselves to generate a, an agreement for the BIA to review. <clears throat> Along those lines, uh, I passed that out where um, I felt that it was essential for the Bureau to tell the tribes what they're going to do because this agreement was drafted, it was perfect, it was nice. And then we also had some concerns on split estates, split estates meaning uh, surface and subsurface. Because the Bureau's take on it is, if we're going to buy that land, we want to buy both surface and mineral. And our take was, if we can at least buy the surface, that's a step ahead. Uh, and so we wanted a clause in there where it can be split estates. The, the second thing was, again, where does the Bureau play a part in, in this agreement? Because we write the agreement, but the Bureau stands back and says yay or nay. We wanted the Bureau to be a part of the agreement as well. Uh, next on the agenda, natural resource. Again, I'll have the cabinet elaborate a little more. Um, I guess I could touch a little bit on it where the tribe is interested in its own use of lands. Uh, currently, the land, land use ordinance does not allow for the tribe. Uh, you know, just reading through the verbiage, we would have to, the tribe would actually have to bid on the track. Then again, uh, certification and so forth. So uh, that's where I'm coming from as far as uh, amending the lease ordinance. Are we as an administration amending the lease ordinance? And then there's a um, possibility of farm grounds being designated for forestry to replant, whether it's veg or, or any type of uh, trees, so we can sell back to BLM or even replant our mountain or wolf mountains or prior mountains. And last but not least, uh, inner office business. Every day we, concerning drug alcohol abuse policies, procedures, anything governing within the executive branch, how do we update, how do we improve? Because the systems that are in place now, I'm not saying they're bad, but they can be improved uh, to have a better uh, workflow, whether it's uh, tarot, enrollment, any, any branch, education. Uh, so if, as we visit those, I've, I've taken it upon myself to give us this first fiscal year to try to iron those things out. 
So the next three years, it should be even more uh, faster to, to produce business. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Yes, uh, do the senators, any questions? Organize Senator Stewart. I made, um, I made a, a, a notice before, but um, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it today officially on the floor here that we, legal counsel and I, we, in our research with the LLCs, we found out that, um, you know, and it is true that, you rec that they don't recognize our, our, um, our law, but every state's the same. They have to file a statement of recognition coming into that state. Now, if the Crow tribe, under Crow tribal law, under our LLC, goes to go work in the state of Montana, and we, we pay the fee of a statement of recognition, $70, <clears throat> they don't recognize the tribe. They, they recognize District of Columbia. And, I mean, it was, it was odd for us to hear that too. But, come to find out, they, I, I did um, let Seaver know, but we heard it from um, Tom Busby. I guess he works under the Secretary of State. And he tried his best to explain to us why we're under the District of Columbia. And we're looking at um, the flexibility of the law of what the Secretary can and can't do. We were trying to see if there was be if there'd be an opportunity for the tribe to just go ahead and adjust those fees. Because right now, all these LLCs that come to work on the reservation, whether it be the milkman or the breadman or whatever, you know, you know, concrete, whatever, any construction company, they're not paying this $70 statement of recognition to the tribe. And the only adjustment that the secretary has flexibility to adjust is up to $25. So I just want to give you notice that I think there's going to, and Bill Watt knows about it not, he, now, and he's seen it as a, a red flag. So I think that's going to be something that, that's going to be coming up for you know, some adjustment in the law. And to make it more easier for our people, right now, we, we're losing money left and right as these businesses come on board. They, they, they're working here for free. And they're going to have to abide by tribal law. Just like you stated earlier, if a company goes and works in the state of Montana, whether it be any other state, they would have to go in there and pay that statement of recognition or stating that they're going to abide by that law. So when those companies come to the reservation and they work here for free, they don't, they don't recognize that they'll abide by our law. Statements. The state of Montana doesn't even recognize our own LLCs, so I think that's something that um, that should be put on the radar because of all the things that are going to be coming up from your nonprofit to your for-profit to your corporations. All of those are going to fall in place with this LLC conversation, and so I think that would be something that because right now the the list of all the fees that need to be to be placed. Out there, I know you. I know you guys are busy over there. You guys got a lot of things going, and but your office needs to set that schedule. And that schedule, that schedule needs to be set. And the flexibility of the the secretary is only in twenty five dollar. It's not in increments. Just a set rate of twenty five dollars that he can can adjust. So, for example, fifty bucks. It can make it seventy five bucks. Right now. Your statement of recognition is at $25. We can only adjust it for $50. So we're losing money. And it doesn't sound like much, but when you see all these companies coming on board, working here for free without any recognition of our law, then it adds up. So I just wanted to give notification to the Secretary's office. Thank you, it's noted. And also, my understanding of that is I don't feel that those companies, sure, they're welcome to, if we set that up, for the companies to come and file with us. But my own feeling on it, personally and professionally, is that our Crow people should be working. So, again, if we're, if we are, if we have the qualified Crow folks doing drywall, that's what we're an advocate for. But allowing 
an entity to come in to file to have that same contract that a crow should have, uh, that's where I'd raise the flag. Um, and you did write a letter to that, to that uh, um, as far as an en entity coming onto the reservation, workforce protection should be upheld. Even, it even governs everything within. But yet, um, the powers that be say, no, it doesn't. And I say, yes, it does, because it's our, it's our law that mandates. I mean, Taro is federal. And if, if they do not abide by the federal laws, then you know, it can easily surpass the tribal court and directly into fed. But they want, the way the court systems work is they want you to exhaust the local, um, local uh, procedures first prior to that. Uh, but ultimately, we are working on those, which you, which you just stated, and it calls for updating, it calls for legislation. Uh, but meanwhile, we hate to bring something over premature and then have to work, work on that here where if we can just, whether, it, whether it's joint or not, we would still want to produce what we can rather than leave anything out. So right now it's not only in the brainstorming sessions, but a lot of the drafting. <coughs> so Siebert's job is, is, is a pretty heavy workload, and it's only him. And yet as he does have the avenues to work with other agencies and entities, you know, it's just all up to him to present that to the legislative body. Meanwhile, as we collaborate with this, what it's doing for us is it's promoting our Crow people to work off reservation. Because right now it's really me as, as a prime example <coughs> surveying off the reservation. You know, my bonding was more, less projects, so forth. But anybody who wanted to take a shot because I was the only surveyor available, you know, they were subject to 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 me and they were they were so curious as to, well, why can't you work on your reservation? But after I did the final product of the survey and turned it over, <coughs> certified it, filed it in Yellowstone, then uh, you know that's a foot in the door off reservation for our entrepreneurs to work both on and off reservation because that provides for Crow families, Crow members, so forth. Uh, yet the tribe itself, we can only hire so many people. And so that's why I'm a big advocate for entrepreneurship. And we have the capable Crows of doing their own thing. Everybody wants to be their own boss. All right, floor recognizes Secretary of the House, Senator Old Crow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, Chairman, Vice, our Secretary, members of the body, honored guests. Uh, I guess one make a comment or a statement in regards to the committees that you were talking about. I think it's very important not to drop the ball and keep it going because it is a very important. We were kind of hashing it out yesterday in regards to some of the committees that we had up there um, the land board the health board and the Carroll Commission. Some of them have, uh, ex terms have expired and they're vacant right now, and they need to be filled. Azab Sahizawon, Azab Mike Bukalaf, he's all mentioned that he's that we need to kind of stop and kind of take a breather and regroup and uh, tie up those loose ends, and, and I believe that's one of them. And I think it's very important, especially the health issue. One of the ones that I didn't put up there was the housing authority, but, um, that was always a position that we could never um, get a foothold on. But now with uh, with the new administration, it, the door is open, and it, uh, Mr. Little all there comes over and visits us all the time, and you know that's great. And now we need to get forward with uh, getting all these uh, ordinances and everything taken care of uh, with the help of the committees. Oh. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, I agree because the demands of these certain programs require a board's decision, such as housing, such as we'll say enrollment. Uh, and without without that uh, established board there, uh, we can't move forward. Uh, but like I said earlier, <coughs> the chairman is is being uh, very uh, precise on who he selects whether it be due to background or, or what have you. Um, it would be easy just to point anybody out, but anymore as, as we want to advance, we, we did set a, a minimal criteria. So 
so we can have the professionals on those on those boards. All right, thank you. For organizer Senator Stewart. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to um, speak to the issue on the the Indian preference. Right now, the Workforce Protection Act has a two-tier um, selection process, and meaning the first tier is Crow. So most likely Crows will get these positions, and I don't think we're done with that conversation. I know I sent a letter out, and I've asked that when you guys' schedules are freed up, we can go ahead and have that conversation. But I just wanted to give note that right now, what I, what, was, what I was told is that there, the selection process was by point system. And so if that's gonna be the case, I think we need to adjust the law to provide for that. Because right now, your regulations and your law does not provide for that. So basically, you're breaking law to try to establish or to fulfill law. So right now, the process of the Workforce Protection Act is to the two-tier process, recognizing and, and um, ultimately favoring pro business and that's the way it was always set up to to move forward as far as the the llc's yeah i, I sat down with um Siever a number of times to um, go over a lot of this stuff but i want to i want to make aware that our direct directors of the executive branch and cabinet heads are are welcome to come over here it's not like the old regime where you know the back door was the front door, and the front door was the back door, you know, anymore. I mean, you can come in the front door, and you can come in here and talk business with any of the co committee chairs. And I want to welcome that, that we do have an open door policy. But what, what I do want um, the executive branch to understand is we are aware of these problems, and we are ready to fix them. And I know there's a lot of things that, that need to come up, and there's just little time. But as far as the the LLCs are concerned. Um, as far as promote, I, I mean, I didn't try to give the impression that I want other business to come on board to do do business here. But regardless, does your tarot get fees from every one of these guys that come over here? I don't think so. And if we if we went after everything that we got on this reservation, from sugar beet factory to all these combiners to the bread man to the Pepsi man to all these business that are all currently non-members that are on the reservation making money, then I think that tarot would be self-sufficient. We wouldn't have no problem. And, but right now we're having, um, we need to, we need to boost that, that part of the um, area of government. That's our first line of defense to give our people jobs. Just like you stated earlier, the government right now, or especially right now, with um, the Sherco plan being down, we don't have enough money coming in to try to satisfy a lot of these um, these positions. And I, just like you guys, I wish we could. And I know it's going to get better. But if we were to help out with uh, these entrepreneurs, now they could pick up the slack here and there, and you know, and whatever may be the case. If they want to go to the Balkan, we can help them. We can assist them to do things like that whereas we don't have to do it all for them. They can go there and get contracts and whether it be truck driving or whether it be labor force or whatever, or, or even if the Crow tribe was to establish a company to go over there. See, these are some of the things that I'd like to see going forward. And if, that, if that's a possibility, you know, just some of the things I mentioned that we need to adjust for in the law, we're ready to do it. And I know the committee chairmen's here that are that are uh, pretty active, they're ready to move forward too on some of those areas. And so if, it, if the four officials can't make it over, that's fine. The directors are there and I believe that's what their job is so they can come over and like Carl does, he comes over all the time and talk about these problems. And that's why we're moving fast in that area. It's just everyone's schedules aren't aligning. But, you know, going after this new ordinance is gonna be bringing in a lot of jobs too. So that's. You know, I just wanted to let, let everyone know that that's that's where we're at. Oh, we have, uh, th thank you, we have uh, full faith in our staff. If we didn't, we wouldn't appoint them or we wouldn't hire them. If our, if our staff can work jointly with the legislative body, especially if it governs their program, you know, that's all the more power to the Crow Nation as a whole rather than just the administration. 
because if we hire an individual who cannot uh, run a program very well and all these stipulations and guidelines and bills govern that office, uh, it, it's, a, it's our fault for having that individual uh, protect our Crow people in that, in that program. <coughs> so I'll, I'll take full responsibility for that. If we have people who can't fork the bill, you know, let me know because you know we we selected various ones that we thought were competent and capable of doing the job. And if and if they're not, you know, just let us know. We're we're open. We're open for discussion. We're open to uh, allow for accountability. <coughs> Transparency is a word. I, I like count accountability a lot better. Accountability for our programs, our people, everything is just. Uh, because without it, um, it's just like paying someone to sit and watch a phone, whether they pick it up or not. You know that. What? How productive are they? So, but any more questions or comments for the secretary of the executive branch? If not, okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Next, this brings us to the CEO. And I believe last time how we had done it is that uh, we had the CEO come up and he's the one that uh, caught up his cabinet heads as we went through that day. So at this time, we're going to hand the floor over to the CEO, Mr. Luke Enemy Hunter, and then he will call up each director as he seems fit to be come up with, to come and uh, present to the senators. So the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Secretary. Buddy. Legislator, yes. According to Legislative Resolution LR 1021, reports are presented by, quote, the lead management official of the tribal government. Within the Old Coyote administration, there are 10 cabinet heads who manage their specific programs and will eventually develop and manipulate their own departmental budgets. This will lead to enhanced finance and program development, accountability, and responsibility in all the departments within the cabinets. Therefore, cabinet heads will present separate program reports for more precise reporting. Consequently, resolution number LR 1021 will need to be amended to reflect the changes in legislative reporting. And before I introduce the cabinet heads to do the reports, I'd like to just give a brief report of some of the things coming out of my office. In, as, uh, as Darren mentioned, and as the uh, secretary mentioned, we're here to meet the needs of the Crow people in all areas of life. And, it, and thus, you know, Darren has been appointing some committees and following our some events and activities that impact the total tribal entity. The Awekwola Wajay Care Center Board of Directors was reestablished by the chairman. I and other members of the executive branch were appointed to that committee to look after the needs, the present, the future, immediate needs of those that are in need of care. The AKCC board meeting was held at the Crow Care Center right away so that we look, we can look at the present needs and future needs of the center. We visited the fact that the Crow Reservation needs a dialysis center presently. It's a real dire need and we, I hired a, uh, through, through procedure, we hired a, uh, a grant writer to look at, at reestablishing dialysis center. It's very doable. There are many grants out there, but it's just that we haven't had the grant writers in place to look into more ar arenas in grants. So we have that in place. The Head Start Governing Board was reestablished by the Chairman to address, to address the needs of the Head Start and some of the concerns that are ongoing with Head Start. I and other members of the Executive Branch were selected to be on that board. Knowing the need of training for all our employees and understanding that you know we're unique as a Crow Nation, the training we need for our employees the information needed for employees is different than any major organization or company. Therefore, coming out of a, uh, a cabinet head meeting 
it was decided that we would do our own training for our own employees. And so in March, we had an all executive branch employee training we held at, in cooperation with the Little Bighorn College. And at that training, the cabinet heads were the presenters and we provided information on strategies, ideas to all the executive branch employees so that they can become better and more productive and more professional Crow tribal employees. And it was well attended. It went out really well because, you know, the cabinet heads were selected because of their expertise, and they, they exhibited their expertise well by providing all of this information to all the employees. You know, it went from everything from ethics to to chain of command, policy and procedure, everything. And so now, you know, we have a, a, a well-informed staff of executive branch employees. As I mentioned, a professional grant writer was hired on a contract to work with with myself and uh, human resources and the grants and contracts office to assist all the departments to meet their needs in the form of grants because they're like i said there are many many grants out there we need someone who can be generic to go out there seek secure and get, gain the money for for grants for all the departments so that's ongoing and the fellow right now you know we're looking at some health grants to again address the need of a dialysis center the, the AKCC re retreat was held in Billings to provide the new board members with information and training relevant to boardmanship. It was real informational because, you know, as new board members, we gained all the information as far as policies and then the future, present, what are the needs, that type of thing. So we're progressing ahead with that. At present, I and Cleora Scott, the COO, you know, sometimes we're asked to come into different departments to provide training because anytime you get a lot of people together, then sometimes there may be some personality conflicts or whatever. But what it may amount to sometimes is some disputes within the within the department. So we've been going around offering training, and then if the department asks for training, we'll go in and do some maybe conflict resolution or personnel policy information that type of thing. And so we've been doing that. Presently, we're working with the water resource department and. And we found that, you know, no matter what is said, you know, departments are working really well together. It's just a matter of someone being there, providing relevant information, and then, you know, reiterating and stressing that we're here for the Crow tribe, and we want to do the best we can to provide what is needed from within your own department and all of the employees. Some of the ongoing things out of my office are that presently I'm doing cabinet, and department observations and evaluations. I'm doing those to identify the needs and progress, progress made by each cabinet, by cabinet head individually and by programs programmatically. And so eventually I will have those and I will rank and file every single department and all the, all the cabinet heads that will be available. I'll make those available to the tribal officials and to the legislative branch. It's not criticizing, but it's actually showing you that some departments are progressing really well. They've moved straight ahead. And some are a little bit slower, but they're moving ahead. And some, you know, we're just kind of being status quo, let's say. But, you know, bottom line, everybody's moving ahead. But in, in what I'm doing, I'm identifying some of those needs along with the cabinet heads so that we can provide training or whatever it is we need for that department to make it a better department and more productive employees. The Montana Advisory Council on Indian Education is a very important uh, committee made up of representatives from every single tribe in the state of Montana and also the Métis. The Crow tribe had not had a representative for a while. So recently I was appointed by Chairman Ohio to be the Crow representative and right away there was a meeting held in Billings. And I've been on a board before, so I understand their responsibilities and their duties. It's a very important committee because we look at all the legislation. We work directly with the Office of Public Instruction and directly with the Governor's Office so that any legislation impacting Crow, Crow, Crow Country and also Indian Country, we're in a position to have some impact on that legislation. Of interest right now is a bill a Indian language preservation bill that is in the Senate right now. 
Now, if this if this bill goes through, then funding will be available. Some major funding will be made available to every single tribe in the Métis. They're going to be apportioned out equally to all the tribes. So I'm kind of keeping my eye on it because it'll fit really well with the immersion grant that we have. But it'll also help us as Crows to to continue on with our language preservation. It, it'll just go hand in hand with the immersion grant. It's not part of it. It's a separate grant we can utilize in, in, you know, we'll have to develop a program in language preservation. So that's going to involve some planning once we get that money. Right now, each cabinet head is developing budgets for their departments. And I think uh, we've extended the financial re aspect of the reporting today so because of that. So that, you know, we have a little more time to develop their budgets. And in developing their budgets, then they have more access to, they have more information based on the financial availability and then looking at their needs and then future, present and future. The personnel policies and procedures manual for the executive branch is presently being, being reviewed and revised. This has been ongoing for a while because initially we looked at it and it didn't really fit this administration really well. And so each cabinet head was given a copy of the personnel policies and they looked at that and they brought in their changes and then through my office then we're going to go ahead and make those changes as brought forth and then it'll go back out so that it fits this administration. Right now, I've been working on a one year, a five year, and a 10 year pro tribe executive branch program economic development plan. This is something that I've been working with with the cabinet heads. Initially, we started out with separate cabinets, as you know, 10 cabinet heads. And initially, I informed that you have total responsibility total accountability as far as your program. And your financial development is dependent on you as a cabinet head. As, uh, as someone mentioned here earlier, sustainability of your department is dependent on your abilities to financially develop and programmatically develop. Financial development means not only just being dependent on the monies that are entitlement monies that come in, but ability to go out and seek and find grants, and then if you bring those in, then we have a grant writer who can help you with that. The grants that may come in, there is, there is a ton of money out there also from philanthropists. There's a lot of money from, from gift giving. You know, why not do a fundraiser? I think it was Chanis one time who said, we don't even have a lemonade stand up at the battlefield. You know, it still kind of amounts to that. We need to go beyond to, to so that every single department is, is viable in its own financial resources and its program development. In this plan that I will eventually write up and I will get to the, to the, uh, to the legislative branch and then to the executive uh, officials is one which I will call, well, you've heard of trickle-down trickle economics. In any organization, at the very top, is a lot of money. It's an organization who has all the money, and with that money, the money trickles down. It goes to departments, it goes to cabinets, whatever it is, jobs are there, people are hired, economy is sustained throughout that infrastructure. Right now, our infrastructure is one where it looks like this bare table here. Just as mentioned before, you know, it's starting where you have to see, see stores, all of these, the gas stations, eventually we get that on this table here, that's what an infrastructure is. We have our own, own structure here within our organization throughout the reservation so that there is some economy, some money that can circulate within that total infrastructure. That's the whole idea. And then if you look at the 10 cabinets within the executive branch, you'll find that as the cabinets develop their programs financially, programmatically, the jobs can be created. Eventually in this plan, as it goes year by year, and then it gets to a point where there is, there is prosperity. It, this prosperity is created by, as we've talked about, prayer, prayer and hope. Recently I saw in a paper where some people came on a pro-reservation, talked about 
you know, we went on to Crow Reservation. We saw there's a lot of drugs and alcohol and there's hopelessness. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. We have people here who pray. We have people here who have a lot of hope for our people, right. our future, our young people. And so with that, you know, it's part of this plan where we came into this administration with the officials praying. Every time we got together, we prayed. Every time we gathered, we had hope for this tribe. Right. Some of that was being lost. Prayers was not used. A lot of hopelessness was there. But I don't, I don't see that anymore because I've got a whole cabinet full of people here who pray, who hope, and who look at this plan and will see that they can develop their cabinet day by day, year by year, so that I, as I evaluate them, you will find that there are some that are probably already at level two, second year, third year, up to 10 years. There are some who are still stagnant. There are some who are moving ahead, normally. But you see, that's the plan. And then this plan, as it trickles upward, the economy goes up until finally one day into prayer, hope, job creation year by year, you get to a point of sustainability. Sustainability is when jobs are created. And no matter who's chairman, no matter who is leading, no matter who the legislators are, the Crow people will continue to have their jobs. It will be sustained. This is how it's done throughout the Indian country in the United States of America. If you go out to other, other tribes, this is what's happening. Now, what it amounts to is once, if the leadership changes, the people who are out there needing jobs now will continue to have their jobs. That is called economic development. That's called financial development. It involves all of us, all of the cabinet heads. And so that's, that's where we're heading with it. I just wanted to report on that, and I wanted to go ahead and lay this plan out already and write it and get it to you, because if I don't, then, you know, it's going to come around from somewhere else, and then the credit where it belongs with the department heads is going to be kind of swayed a little bit, and I don't want that to happen because it has to come from the executive branch working in coordination with the judicial department, the legislative department, because as you know, as we move ahead, there are many things we need to do which need your approval. It needs legislation, it needs resolutions. And as it moves forward, it needs the protection and the guidance of the law and order department, also the justice department. And so that's where we're going with this plan. And so, as I mentioned, you know, each cabinet knows their business well, and they're going to report to you more specifically and more concisely, so I'm going to go ahead and call on each one alphabetically to be democratic about it. So, in alphabetic order, Bertie Rielbert, Cabinet Head of Education, will go ahead and give her a report first. Thank you. Speaker of the House, Senators, and M. Sullivan. Crow Nation's Department of Education goal is to promote and enhance the educational opportunities for all enrolled Crow tribal members from preschool to post secondary education. In the Education Department, we have Tribal Scholarships Program. Coordinator is Alberta Fitch Wall. Her administrative assistant is Gary Dawes. Program is being funded by 107 Boundary Settlement, contract number 150H. Period of award is from October 1 to 2012 to September 30, 2013, in the amount of $579,224. Program is at a continuation status. Another program in education is higher education. Coordinator is Tina Pretty on top. Her administrative assistant is Crystal Firebear. Program is being funded by Bureau of Indian Education Model Contract. Contract number A13 AV00410. Period of award is October 1, 2012 to September 30, 2013 in the amount of $750,098.39. Program is at a continuation status. The next program in the education department is adult vocational training and job placement. Coordinator is Newton Old Crow Jr. 
His administrative assistant is Myra Medicine Horse. Program is being funded by Bureau of Indian Affairs, contract number 12AV00409. Period of award is fiscal year 2013 in the amount of $260,227.89. Program is at a continuation status. The next program in education department is Johnson O'Malley. Coordinator is Marlene Walking Bear. Program is being funded by Bureau of Indian Education. Contract number A12 AV00410. Period of award is October 1, 2011 to September 30th, 2012 in the amount of $140,225. Program is at a continuation status. Epsaloga, the next program under education department is Epsaloga Preschool Language Immersion Project. Project director is me. Project coordinator <coughs> is Loretta Three Irons. Project is being funded by Administration for Native Americans. Contract number 90NLD560-01. Period of award is August 1. 2012 to July 31st, 2013, in the amount of $282,170. Next program is under Education Department is Child Care and Development Funds. Program Director is Martha D. Crane and Helen Realbird. Program is being funded by Administration for Children and Families, contract number 600. Period of award is October 1, 2012 to September 30th, 2013 in the amount of $586,843. Program is at a continuation status. The next program under education department is the Crow Head Start. Program director is Agnes Lufthan. Her fiscal manager is Cassandra Little Owl. Program is being funded by Health and Human Services, contract number 90C19797-10. Period of award is July 1, 2012 to June 30, 2013, in the amount of $2,983,280. Program is on the brink of competitive status. Fund summary, tribal scholarship program at $579,224. Higher education at $750,098. Adult vocational training and job placement at $260,228. Johnson O'Malley at $140,225. Absaloga Preschool Language Immersion at 282,170. Child Care and Development Funds at 586,843. Crow Head Start at 2,983,280. Totaling 5,582,068 dollars. Okay. The sequestration impacts the following federal programs at a 5% 5% proposed cuts, higher ed. Proposed cut would be 20,133. Adult vocational training and job placement at $11,356. Johnson O'Malley cut, $6,231. Child care and development funds, $29,342. Crow Head Start is at $115,131. Sequestrant cuts at 5% total for all programs, all federal programs, it is at $182,193. Our office is proposing to, that cuts will be on line items for travel, supplies. We want to avoid cuts on monies going to students. Thank you. Any questions or comments? For organizer Senator Stewart. I just got one um, question, and I don't know who would be able to answer it, but you probably were. But 
with the Cloud Peak, um, 75,000 that's supposed to be coming. Was there a selection committee already established? Yes, there'll be a selection, Cloud Peak, their program, their vocational program, and the education department will get together to make selections. I've got it just a and quick comment. And if you want to see it, it's on, the, excuse me, Go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Um, we have our <laughs> monthly reports. Mr. Luke Enemy Hunter's office has all the reports. And I have a report on called Peak uh, Under Education. And you can read about it. Pardon? Any other? I just got a quick comment. Uh, it pertains to the Head Start in Harden. We got a letter from some employees who are tribal members over there. And they were notified last week that they're going to be closing the Head Start over there at Harden. So um, are the students going to be coming this way to close the room for the students is my question. No, there's, there's no, no room, room for, for it. We have a waiting list um, at the Crow Center. And I think all the centers have a waiting list. Okay. Could you get us a copy of that? Because what we're trying to do is to... Uh, we want to send a resolution for the legislative branch <coughs> to the Billings Head Start, which uh, operates all the Head Starts, which are Lockwood, Laurel, uh, Shepherd, several in Billings, Red Lodge. And our question is, why are they looking at shutting Harden down when, like, for example, in Red Lodge, they only have nine, nine Head Start students, and they won't shut that Head Start down, but they'll, they'll shut down a full Head Start, which is mostly Crow kids in Harden when it comes to sequestration. So we just need that information to kind of beef up our letter to the uh, the Head Start Board in Billings. So if you could get that to uh, either uh, Jackie or Sherry at the, and just leave it with them so we can use that for our information for our resolution. We'd appreciate it. Can you give me that question or um, in the, writing uh, so that I could get all of it? Yes. Did yes. anybody back there get notes? Loretta has notes, okay. We, I, we, we just want to show, because they, we, I contacted them already and asked you, why are you looking at Harden first? <coughs> we know it's all pro kids okay. there. Okay. And they said, well, they could be, be uh, fit in, they should be able to fit into the Head Start at Crow or any other the Head Starts on the reservation, but I want to show where there's already a waiting list. And I want to see why aren't they looking at Red Lodge? only has nine kids. So uh, just just to help us out, we appreciate it. We will. All right, thank, thank you. you. No more questions or comments? All right, Mr. Enemy Hunter, go ahead and bring your next cabinet head. On a question from Senator Stewart, I'd like to elaborate that. Anytime you want to come into my office, you know, I get weekly reports from all the departments. If you want to go back into the history a little bit, ever since the first week, you know, I have weekly reports from all the cabinet heads. So if you want to ever come into my office and take a look, you know, it's wide open. So come take a look sometimes. Next presenter will be Clarice Denny from the Human Resource Department, cabinet head, Clarice Denny. Senators, this is my first appearance in front of this legislative body. I'd like to, um, first of all, I'd like to give a little background of my own. After 37 years of public service with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I retired and accepted the appointment as cabinet head for the HR department, and yet to be confirmed by this legislative branch. I reported to work on January 25th and to this new cabinet created by the tribal chairman for this new administration for a positive change. My responsibilities includes Excuse me. Oversight. Please. Can we can we get some these guys to share their conversation outside? 
and we, we like to hear clear speak. Kind of disrespectful. Lord, proceed. My responsibilities includes oversight of personnel, tribal employment rights office, workforce, uh, investment act, that's OIA, tribal elders program, the senior citizens, information technology, that's the IT, and executive security, and home care providers. I delegated Todd Wilson, the health director, to monitor the providers for me for now. Chairman Okayo appointed Laura Pickett, personnel director, and myself on the board of directors for the Awekulawaja Nursing Home. The chairman also appointed C Senator Lee Not Afraid, Jackie Blacksmith, Luke, Enemy Hunter, Marlon Passes, Jackie Stewart, uh, to the Nursing Home Board too. These appointments are for three years. At the first meeting, I was elected board chairman, and on April 3rd, the new board attended an orientation in doings. Chairman O'Kyle appointed at Wiener Little Light Luke and myself <coughs> to also serve on the Head Start Governing Board. We, I, we, I have attended several meetings on Head Start's non-compliance issues, but I haven't had an update on those yet. In addition, one of my collateral duties is to serve on the Ethics Committee for the Executive Branch. Attached with this report is an organizational chart listing all of the programs and staffing under the Department of Human Resources. The directors are all under my supervision and I am under the supervision of the CEO. The HR cabinet head provides technical assistance, guidance, and oversight for all the programs under the Department of Human Resources. For personnel, uh, Laura Riobert is the director, Taro Louis Goodluck, director, IT department, Vincent Bad Bear, chief IT, for the WIA program, Cecilia Big Lake, director, Senior Citizens Director, <coughs> Mary Jane Burton Brown, Executive Security, Jeff McDonald, and for home care, I de delegated those uh, duties to Todd for now, but eventually I'll uh, resume those uh, duties. Overview <coughs> Personnel. The personnel director and staff are responsible for preparation of all requests for personnel actions for all programs under the executive branch in accordance with the Crow Tribal Personnel Policies and Procedures. <coughs> the personnel action forms requires <coughs> the approval of the personnel director and the HR cabinet head per executive order from the chairman, Darren O'Coyote. All selections for employment are reviewed by the executive officials before we process those documents. The director is also responsible to maintain all active official personnel records for all programs. Enforcement of the Crow Tribal Drug Testing Policy um, was uh, a directive came from the Chairman Okayo to enforce the tribe's drug testing policy. It's ongoing. 
and the data is included in your folder. And employees who fail the drug tests are referred to the Crow Tribal Wellness Program. All referrals are on voluntary basis. The legal department is in the final stages of revising the current Crow Tribal personnel policies and procedures and some of my duties will be in the revision. <clears throat> Re the personnel director received letters of inquiry from attorney Tom Tall for eight former employees who were laid off from the previous administration. Those letters were referred to the legal department for a response. Terrell. Quarterly report is attached with a list of the certified contractors, including a quarterly report to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The terms for the current Tarot Commission expired this month, 2013. The commission is composed of seven members, one from each district, and one at large. The commission uh, must be nominated by the executive chairman and confirmed by the legislatures. Executive security quarterly report includes um, re-emphasizing their duty to protect the executive officials and employees of the executive branch in a peaceful and professional manner applaud to our director for raising his own funds to purchase new polo ties with a tribal emblem. Five employees in the security are certified to do drug testing. It's a major project we're only half done on that. Project manager for IT and staff working diligently to provide all network users with continuous workflow to keep the tribal entities and various departments connected to both the network resources and internet access while providing security and confidentiality. When necessary, the staff, the IT staff, will work on weekends for continuity of IT services for the executive branch. Senior citizens, the direct director reported all centers are now fully staffed. Centers are located in Crow Agency, Lodgegrass, and Pryor. The director and staff attended all required training to provide necessary nutrition for healthy meals for our tribal elders age 60 and over. Service includes daily delivery of meals to the elders at their residences. The Workforce <coughs> Info Investment Act, the WIA Director and Office Clerk, there's only two in that program. They provide job service placements for clients to acquire job skilled uh, employment. And the home care providers, I, uh, taught, um, assign uh, diabetic outreach workers to make home visits and attach as a, a list of the providers. Uh, a training, Todd has a, a scheduled a training for April 23rd for those providers. The directors and staff under the HR department have demonstrated their dedication to fulfill their job requirements, even with limited resources, and have never complained or requested for wage increases. I have a good working relationship with all my directors and my staff and with the legal department and we uh, work closely with Kristen Birch. She's our attorney for the HR 
uh, department. All right. Thank and you. I, yeah. that, I just like to, uh, before I open the floor for any questions or comments, I'd like to commend you on this, this report. I was reading through it as you were going, give me a report. If you guys, if the senators would take notice that even they have the, the rate of pay that the workers are getting, receiving. And then the other thing I like is that even, even the security made a report in here. It shows the schedules of the old security and I, I commend I commend you on this very fine report because this Thank is something you. that we the senators kind of look at as we go through different uh, grants and whatnot that comes up then we can kind of relate oh this is why they need this and you know so before I open the floor I'd just like to congratulate you and job well done on this report and I thank you for this report at this time senators are there any questions or comments floor recognizes senator Lucille Other Medicine, Reno District. Uh, welcome everyone, speaker, secretary, members of the uh, legislature branch, the community members and executive branch and personnel. I would like to commend Clarice for the good booklet that we receive. It's, you know, it demonstrates transparency and I like, you know, how it's put together, like how many, how the, uh, personnel are how much they're making and it gives us an idea of you know uh, a good department <laughs> thank you organizer senator stewart oh clarice um you know the reason a lot of before when we would ask for these reports first of all it's constitutional requirement second of all you know we would have we would when we go to district members they come in or else they visit with us we have nothing when the people come up, they would, they would, um, they would just tell us, kind of pat themselves on the back. They won't tell us deficiencies. They won't tell us the problems versus the, the pros and cons, you know. And we need to know that the, the pros and the cons, so then that way we can help improve. And like I stated earlier to the directors, cabinet head, you know, your staff, the door is open here. You know, the the committee chairs are in the interim between the sessions. They're willing to they're willing to assist in all these areas and and it's good i believe you set the bar oh thank you before i recognize the senator not afraid of the valley of the chiefs district thank you mr speaker mr secretary members of the body executive branch officials and honored guests i, I just had a comment um Cook, i want to reiterate the speaker's point on a, a, a well-written report, great presentation by uh, Clarice Aholmachman. Uh, it, it's been an honor to be able to uh, work with you on the Awea Kolawaja uh, board. And I just wanted to make a comment, Mr. Speaker, um, with reference to uh, the, the board's concern at one of the meetings was the expansion of uh, the protection of elders mm -hmm. in reference to elder abuse. I did mention to the board and Clarice and also Dr. Enemy Hunter was there uh, that it would probably be ideal for the board to formulate uh, proposed legislation and then take it through the, or uh, funnel it through the uh, chairman's office. And uh, I just wanted to make that comment and uh, give notice to the body that there will probably be legislation coming forth in, in, in the near future with the expansion of the protection of our elders. I hope, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Floor recognizes Senator Tuleg in the Black Lodge District. Oh, Speaker, Secretary, members of the body, members of the Executive Branch and General Counsel, I'd like to um, commend Clarice on your efforts and your um, compiling this well good report because it's former, former chairman of personnel and um, and currently the secretary of personnel for the committee. You know, it's probably the best report that I've seen from the personnel department. So I'd like to commend you on your efforts in compiling this report. And um, just on another note, uh, I got a meeting here for at 3.30, but before I go, I wanted to just make an insight on you know, I was going to say it when AJ was talking, but you know, it comes into this department too with personnel. 
that to making sure that uh, the staff of the executive branch are assuring that outside companies that come into the reservation do fall into compliance, such as we just now passed the towing bill last week before we um, recess for the weekend. And with that, we wanted to make sure that the tarot compliance officers do go out and make sure that these companies that are coming and doing business onto the reservation, that they are in compliance and that they are within the jurisdiction of the tribe. And so I just wanted to state that and that the personnel does have that ability to enforce that with WPA and Tarot. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. For organized Senator Stewart. I just wanted to give you notice that um, Francine Shakespeare of the Eastern Shoshone, they're ranked way up there in Tarot, that they did give an ex um, the, um, they extended an invite to the Crow tribes, so that that way compliance officers and whatnot will be able to to um, work together and if they need training or questions, because them guys over there, they, they operate on like $1.5 million budget, $2 million budget, and their, their reservation's smaller than ours, and they're not mixed to Bellings. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before Mr. Enemy Hunter in introduces the next uh, cabinet head, I'd just like to inform everyone that we have a camera that's running, but it's not to record, but we're live stream when we're in session. And just to let the, you people know that uh, as you're reporting to the legislative branch, you're reporting to people who log on during, during session. So just to let you know, so uh, just, just for everyone's information. And then if you want to watch this, we also put it on YouTube. If you'd like to, if anyone had missed today's reporting and they want to see what it was all reported today, you can tell them to log on to the legislative branch, go type, go on to YouTube and then type in Crow Legislative Branch reports and then it'll be on there tonight on YouTube as well. So go ahead, uh, Mr. CEO. Next report will be from Cody Gregory, cabinet head of the Water Resources. provisions 
for the implementation of two large programs to, to be administered by the Crow Tribe under the oversight of the U.S. Department of Interior's Bureau of Reclamation, which we work with closely every day. Um, namely, the, the programs established in sections 405 and 406 are the Crow Irrigation Project, which we call CIP, with an, with an agreement that was executed September 13, 2011. And the Crow Municipal, Rural, and Industrial um, Water System, which we refer to as the MRMI project, with an agreement that was, uh, was initiated on August 30th, 2012. Both of these agreements or contracts were entered into and executed through the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, uh, Public Law 638, and authorized by this, this body, the uh, Pro Tribal Legislature and your resolutions. The, uh, the two agreements drive much of our daily operations and activities within the department, uh, largely with planning, construction, um, and administrative support. Uh, the past three months have involved, um, quite frankly, a lot of reorganizational efforts um, within, the, uh, within the department. The major reorganizational re uh, accomplishments I resulted in a refocus on our program objectives, uh, our planning initiatives and activities, our staffing uh, adjustments, as well as budget adjustments. And uh, Titus uh, Tayskin will, will, will provide uh, Paul and me um, more detail, at least on these, on these efforts in, in a few minutes. However, I do want to note that uh, in, during my oversight of these activities. Um, uh, although sometimes it's been uh, uh, disruptive uh, to, our, to our, our, our program, it's resulted in, uh, in a much more focused and productive workforce. Uh, the department now can focus, in my opinion, on more production, productivity, and accountability. The, uh, the pro-tribal um, Water Resource Department, um, to just give you an idea of some of the other things that we've been working on, um, has been working closely with legal counsel, that's Aiken Gump, uh, to address uh, other key components of the Settlement Act and water compact. Uh, currently, activities are directed towards assisting um, in the, the Montana court adjudication process. Uh, there's uh, much work is being uh, worked on with verification and, uh, and objections to uh, particularly a lot of the non-Indian claims within the nine uh, water basins on, the, on and adjacent to the reservation. The Crow um, Water Resource Department and Legal Council assisted uh, the Montana Water Court recently uh, with public information meetings uh, in February, actually the days were February 27th and 28th. Um, and those were located here in Crow Agency, Pryor, Billings, and in Hardin. Um, the, um, the water users who <coughs> filed claims with the state of Montana have 180 days for filing objections the water court if they feel that they're being harmed by this water compact. And uh, that date uh, slips me, but I believe it's June 24th is uh, the, uh, the last day of the session. And during those public uh, sessions, approximately 300 people attended uh, those various meetings. So it, it, there's, there's a lot of interest and, and it's very well attended. In the upcoming months, um, the Crow Tribe Water Resource Department um, will be working with legal counsel to assist the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the U.S. Justice Department with public informational meetings for the current list use, or the current loot, excuse me, 
the current use list, these names, you guys have to get rid of through all the, uh, the legislation, it's amazing, but it's called the current use list of the Crow tribe members' water uses. And uh, what, what that is, is the Bureau of Indian Affairs and their contractors have identified many of the uses, including irrigation, stock ponds, wells, springs, um, and domestic, plus municipal uses um, for our tribal members. And the purpose of the meetings will be to provide the opportunity for the pro-tribal membership to verify their current uses on their lands. Um, it's anticipated that these meetings will be held in each of our district halls on the reservation, as well as at least two uh, off-site um, uh, locations on the top reservation. Um, and then at the end of those meetings, uh, the individuals again will have 180 days to add additional information um, either to the U.S. government or to, to us, the tribe, as far as what their water uses uh, are. And so it's, it will be a big opportunity for our membership to really take a look at where current are give them the opportunity to participate in this process. Um, the, I was talking with the Bureau of Indian Affairs this morning on this issue, and uh, they have been impacted with the, the budget cuts, but they're anticipating that these meetings will probably be either late May or early June. So we'll be working closely, and of course there'll be a lot of notification coming out on that. Um, the Crow Tribe Water Resources Department is also um, just recently established and initiated the Crow Tribal Water Code Technical Team. And this team will begin immediate work with, with you, the legislative body, um, to develop and to finalize the water code. Um, and I'm hoping to start that dialogue uh, with the various committees uh, in early May, hopefully the first week in May. We're getting organized there and it'll be a good day. The, um, the team um, will have a, a finalized water code uh, completed uh, with your help. Uh, we're, we're targeting December 2013. And uh, then the code will be submitted for final approval to the Secretary of Interior in early 2013. And then lastly, um, we're, we're also just beginning early discussions with Bureau of Land Management, or Bureau of uh, Reclamation, on the establishment of a Crow uh, Tribe Storage Allocation Agreement, which uh, was, uh, which is, lies behind uh, Big Horn Lake, or within Big Horn Lake, behind the Delgado Dam. Um, and that, of course, was authorized in the uh, compact and the act. But we, at this point, um, we don't have a, a completion date, but uh, we definitely want to uh, get to moving on that. Um, that completes uh, my remarks at this point. Uh, I'll have Titus uh, fill you in with uh, more details on really what much of the program is doing today with the uh, CIP and MRI. So you're going to have uh, Titus do the last yeah. Last of your yeah. report. Okay. Uh, Mr. Right. Speaker, I'll yes, ask uh, a question before, before you leave. This comes up, please. Floor recognizes Senator goes ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I know that uh, well, the water code, uh, I know that it has to come, come here, uh, you know, by, by law, the, uh, the, enumerated, the enumerated power of the legislative branch, and the law is created here. And I know that I think that's what I'm saying is, uh, you know, the is natural resources, but Myself, I want to give the heads up that we're going to, I'm going to, uh, I got a, got a draft on the water code, and I know that's a uh, flat bit. He asked for that uh, water, uh, the draft, but I want to, I'm going to be uh, introducing that probably sometime before September, but uh, you know, I know that we, uh, for a clarification, May or June, the meetings for the what is it, the water rights uh, uh, they're going to have going to each district or what's the deal? Right, yeah, um, 
this actually has two prong question. And uh, number one, yeah, we would really very much as a team like to work with you on on where you are with the water code. Uh, we would really very much like to work hand in hand on that. Um, the the infor, infor, informational meetings is actually um, it's an effort between the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Justice Department to um, take a look at all the current uses on trust land within the reservation. And what they're going to be doing is notifying all of the landowners within the reservation and all, all, all landowner uh, tribal members uh, of, this, of these meetings and, and through a notification process. And what they're going to be doing is actually they will have maps and all the allotments and all the uses identified. There'll be an opportunity for the public to actually take a look and go to their particular piece of property and see whether the Bureau and their contractors have actually identified a spring or a stream or a stock water tank or what have you on it. And because what we want is that's uh, very important as we go into the final negotiations on, on water adjudication of the court, that we have all of our uses identified. Yeah, yeah, I know that uh, when they came to prior, I wasn't there, but I know that there was a report back to me from uh, the, the tribal uh, constituents, the prior uh, Arrowhead District uh, constituents. Uh, there was quite a few on uh, white people, you know, that, that showed up ranchers, but there's also a amount of, a certain amount of uh, tribal members that showed up. So I know that they still have a lot of questions they have to ask. As a representative, uh, there's still a lot of questions that are, are, are very uh, not, not clear. So that's one thing that I, I want to get to the bottom of. I want to know and give them some answers that they need. But it's really a lot of the allottees are very leery. And don't, don't really trust anybody at this time. Not the BIA either. Right. No, I understand. It, but that, if I could finish up with uh, the statement that it is that the entire purpose is actually for that opportunity for them to uh, to look at the information and uh, and verify and provide additional. Yeah, uh, 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 I'll give you my card. That way, you can notify me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate the fact that uh, every year in January, in January session, we would remind the past administration that the water code is very important. And once again, the deadline is March 2014. So I reiterate the fact that, you know, this has to be very important. It's something we need to look at this this summer, maybe, you know, July session. We can look at it because it's going to have to come through here and then we all have to get something ready to present and then go forward from there. Right. But uh, Florida and I, Senator Stewart, at this time. Oh, Mr. Speaker, Secretary, members, guests, um, executive officials, I just want to you know, I appreciate you know, the fact that you're, you know, you're stating that you're willing to meet with the committee, but you know, it's basically not necessarily a, you know, a, I guess you don't have to, but you know, we're, you know, we we're gonna we're gonna call for meetings, and so, you know, I'm I know you're I know you're busy, but there's two of you guys. When I call for a meeting, I when I ask for one of you guys to show up at that meeting, because before I was I call for a meeting, and I've been told that both of you guys had to be at this place, or both of you guys had to go to that place, and and it is important, you know we gotta we gotta draft up this law, and all the questions pertaining to the allottees, the um, rights, and their uses, their usage of the water on their lands, it's very important. That's who we represent as, as officials for our districts, respective districts. So, you know, um, just to let you know when I, when I call for a meeting again, that 
I won't get um, um, stood up. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll try it all over again. Thank you. If we apologize if you felt that way. Um, let me just go back, just if I could, just clarify one little bit on the uh, on the core team. Actually, what we've, we've established is actually myself, um, we've, we're, we've gotten um, a former solicitor, uh, solicitor here in the work on the contract who worked uh, in water rights uh, to, uh, to help, particularly with the drafting of, of uh, legal language and so forth. So we would very much like to work with you. And, and that's been an access is to try and get a group put together that can work with the legislature. And it's, I'm happy to hear that there's a lot of work that's been done. There. So we probably have to catch up a little bit, but we would really welcome that opportunity. Floor organizer Senator Carlos of the Las Vegas District. Okay, my question is uh, you know that uh, no matter what we do in this uh, developing water code, whatever, but you know that we're going to go to court on uh, the Alati, the uh, people that are living here in the reservation, the state of Montana and federal government. We're all going to be involved in the court case. To me, that's the way I look at it. And are your uh, legal ponies ready to have some kind of challenge like that? Or are you just going to uh, hire somebody else? You know, but that's uh, my main concern is as they claim to May 7th, 1868, water usage. When they weren't even here, but they still filed that in the courts, you know. So that's the big issue. And you know that, uh, that we'll be winding up in court no matter who's going to file first. So no matter how much color coding you have on there, but are we prepared to go to court, you know? You know, is who are you going to get representation? Your our own legal or Aiken Gum or get somebody else? And that's a big question, big concern of mine. That uh, you know, no matter where I go, look at this uh, water settlement, and everybody wants to claim their part of water. So even uh, some of the people that weren't even here at a certain point is still claiming water, and. That's the thing that uh, the real big issue. Everybody wants our water, and they, we passed a, a law saying that it's an act now. You know, so we just kind of uh, like you as a water user, uh, they make you pay for your uh, own input charges. You know, so in turn, was that uh, legislation 1920. They uh, have that uh, acreage limitation, but they never enforce that part. So, but they make you enforce us to pay, but they never enforce this law. So it's kind of a double jeopardy here, and we're going to come to that issue. We'll be winding up in court. So, you know, I, I like to know who's going to represent us. You know, that's a big important issue. There's uh, water lawyers out there that are professionals at their job. So are we going to have Bill Watt represent us? You know, those kind of issues, you know. So that's my kind of concern, you know, because people uh, want to know what, where we're headed with this. And I so, said, well, you already gave your other shoe away, so next shoe is probably going to go to court, you know. Thank you. <coughs> Organizer Senator Stewart. You know, on that note that um, Senator Covers have stated, you look at the news today, right now, Flathead, Flathead thought they were going to have a compact that was going to pass before the Senate or before the House, before their legislative branch in this session, and it don't look like it. So, um, they're, they've already said, well, it's pretty clear to us that the state of Montana wants to go to court. You know, the reason why I bring that up is because these are the same people we're going to have to work with on this water code to establish water usage for non-members as well as members. 
and these are the same people that are going to object to the Crow tribe's water use, and these are the same ones that are objecting to the to the long um, since 1979, I believe it was. They were negotiating, and right now they didn't they didn't get it passed. So, and it looks like Flatheads are are claiming our ancestral lands as well as far as water is concerned. So, um, you know. It's pretty evident to me that the state of Montana doesn't want to cooperate. So that's kind of, it gives us a heads up, kind of a hindsight. Any more questions or comments? Uh, Floor organizer Senator goes ahead, the Arrow Creek District. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, Secretary, members of the body and the executive branch. I know that we can go on and on on this, but you know that the enforceability date is, is April. And then, you know, it also says I asked the, our attorney to bring this out on the, uh, uh, the enforceability date. It says, uh, the enforceability date shall be the date on which the secretary publishes in the Federal Register a statement of findings that it goes to the subsections A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, G. And he said the Montana Water Court has issued a final judgment and decree approving the compact, or if the Montana Water Court is found to lack jurisdiction, the district court of jurisdiction has approved the compact as a consent decree and such approval is final. But you know, one of the, that's really my, you know, one of my concerns is that whatever the waivers are, there's waivers in there, you know, of our, and that's, that's really our concern. We have to get on this, we have to be on the same page, and, and but, but you know, that that's something that, uh, you want to turn over, you want to turn every stone and make sure that we haven't overlooked anything. But I, so that's something that that uh, but that enforceability date is uh, I don't like that. So, anyways, that's my, that's real my concern on the enforceability date. So, yeah, and and unfortunately, well, uh, I'm not I, I don't have the legal background to really answer that for you, but. I can hear that, and my personal belief is that as we work through this process, I think a lot of these questions are going to flush out, and uh, and and I think at that point in time we really will get a lot of a lot of our concerns answered. But we 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 need to we can't be working in a vacuum. We really do need to get out on the floor and, and talk about it. So that's why uh, I really do welcome the opportunity to, to join with your efforts. Mr. Speaker, yes, go ahead, one more go comment ahead. and we can uh, see a year ago, a year ago, the chairman never brought any, you see the waivers of sovereign immunity, anything waivers is supposed to come in here. Waivers, Citric in April, what was that, it's 27th or April, what was that, remember? April 27th. Yeah, April 27th. That's where I was pretty, pretty upset that day. And, he, and to remind you, Mr. Speaker, you have to, you know, make me calm down. See, this compact had, is supposed to waivers. Cause they did it. And that's when April 27th, during the April session, the uh, uh, you know, Cedric made a report in here. If he's going to make any waivers on behalf of the tribe, the waivers of sovereign immunity lies in this branch. He never did that. That's my argument. And still, we're going to try to enforce this so J.A.R. are going to deal with it. If he wants to do that waiver, he has to come in here and then take it. And I think he did something illegal, and then we're still trying to entertain that. That's what I'm concerned about. The chairman itself cannot do any waivers. And that's what we're entertaining to that today. So I'm still standing on that. He can do that, the chairman can do that, can waive your rights without asking the, with this branch, because this branch has the sole authority to make that. And Kojarekta, Koda, Bairakazaku, Gusala, the Kajitu Gina. And so this JAR, what the current chairman, has to do is have a joint action resolution that, hey, 
that I agree with that waiver. I, or, or the waiver is being has been voted and ratified by the legislature. Which to me is illegal. This water complex is illegal because it's never been ratified by this branch. That's what we, we haven't done. That's why I was pretty upset that day. He never brought any legislation and he said, I'm going to waive, you know, the Takchia Maokolov, the Psalm, get Takchidaira, waive Kojik without ratifying it here, without us agreeing on that. And you, Anusa, and so today, this is a message that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this because the water goes with the land. And the water, even the Section 2 violators will have title to the land because the water goes with it. Title all it again, within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. And now what is a new gospel? Title all it, water right all it, and go ahead, title all it. But now, if I get, if we don't stand against this, that there, it wasn't ratified by this, uh, by the Crow legislature, that Cedric Black Eagle waived your right as a whole, water right, boss, that's it. We should have, you should have brought that legislation in here. But as a whole, that's it. Hey, Manuel knows that, I know that. That is something that he overlooked. It's never been ratified. So that is my point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? I believe we had uh, Mr. Pickson to come up to complete your report. Okay. Floor recognizes Titus Pickson with the Water Resource Department. <coughs> Thank you, Speaker, Secretary, legislative body, executive officials, and honored guests. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I'd like to just uh, go into a little bit of detail of exactly what our plans are for, uh, for the summer and uh, winter, so for the next year, basically. So um, I realize we have a lot of people to go through, so I'll try and make this as quick as I can, but uh, if you guys have the, um, I passed out the Crow Tribe Water Resource Department, CIP, Irrigation, Core Irrigation Plan. You guys should have a handout like that. <clears throat> but uh, first project we're gonna go through is uh, basically rotten grass waste weight. Um, this was a project that BIA did about five years ago, but it's, um, if it doesn't get, it's eroded pretty bad, so if it doesn't get fixed um, immediately, that's something that could fail. Uh, that's the first thing we're going to tackle. The, uh, we're going to do a little bit of work at um, Reno. Um, originally, the Reno site work was a was a, um, a project that was done through um, HKM, and I'll elaborate that one in a minute. But um, a little bit of site work that needs to be done in order for safety and some conditioning for um, through the summer, and make sure the um, waterways are clear so that uh, irrigation can cont can, can continue. Uh, there's a, some items that we did um, through, again, HKM. It was um, uh, agency diversion dam. There was some, um, uh, there was a lot of erosion that took place through there. And, um, we basically finished it, um, but there's you know, a few line items that we need to complete. Um, large grass, uh, headworks, number one and number two. Um, again, we pretty much completed those, and um, again, just a couple line items that we need to finish to close out the, um, the contract. Uh, <clears throat> the main canal uh, below the after bay um, is basically some prep work for future restoration that can be done. And uh, Willow Creek, um, again, there's some uh, real re rehabilitation work that, and a lot of these things we can do um, basically through the irrigation season. Um, as you guys well know, the you know once the irrigation waters are on, there really isn't too much work that we can 
do, but there are, there are some minor things that we can do to keep a lot of our, some of our guys busy. Um, so number seven prior, uh, rehabilitate the canals through the town, under a cold storage building. Um, we need to establish some, um, some sites outside here so we can minimize our travel time and keep our guys more productive uh, closer to the working areas. And again, uh, <clears throat> in the fall, in the winter is when our actual construction season um, begins. And it's a lot, obviously a lot different from most construction seasons that you're aware of. So uh, when uh, irrigation waters are turned off and the weather starts to get bad, that's when we go to work um, in, the, in the CIP. So our first major um, project will be uh, high check on the Bighorn Canal, the high check and drop, and the design will be completed in October. The second one is a renal diversion dam. Again, there was a little bit of work done through HKM, but um, some of the design aspects that they uh, wanted was, they wanted us to pay a lot more. It was too elaborate than what was actually needed. So um, we actually went with another company um, to complete this project. And then, of course, um, the main canal lining, when we'll actually do the lining on after the, will be the third. So on the second page is kind of a, a schedule of what our plans are, time frames, dates, and uh, just to show exactly when we're anticipate doing this. And of course, construction is, uh, you know, things change all the time, but we're hoping to stay as close to the schedule as we can. So again, the products that we've um, completed to date is uh, agency, diversion, rip wrap repairs, uh, renal diversion, rehabilitation. And again, that was just some minor work, uh, investigation work, basically. Uh, third one, Lodge Grass Canal number two had works. Number one had works at Lodge Grass. And um, the following pages, I guess we wanted to just let you see some of the before and after pictures of what was actually done. And um, so the first one, the set of pictures is, uh, of course, the agency of the rip wrap was done. The second one, Lodge Grass one. Um, we basically rehabilitated all the deficiencies that were there, uh, put some head gates in, and also uh, put a catwalk through there. Same thing with agency, or I'm sorry, Lodge Grass number two, same thing, but that one was a little bit more elaborate where <coughs> we actually um, fixed the, the spillways and the gateways. And again, with another um, catwalk. The number five um, is actually Bighorn High Check, which was done with uh, another company. So I'll elaborate up on that one in a minute. But um, just to let you guys know on what was completed with HKM, those first four projects. Um, initially, we had eight, uh, eight contracts um, signed with uh, HKM. And the total amount was approximately 680,000 within those within those eight contracts and because midstream we decided uh, that HKM wasn't providing the proper uh, needs that we had so we decided to um, look into different avenues for uh, engineering design and construction so in the end we only ended up using uh, approximately three hundred and ninety thousand dollars of the within that contract. So we only spent about fifty-seven percent of what we initially initially negotiated. So if you continue, uh, that brings me into uh, Bartlett and West, and Bartlett and West is who we uh, chose to go with. What we did initially is um, we had three other. Uh, engineering firms that were interested in, in uh, doing this work for us. So we um, developed a committee and we basically interviewed each one of the firms that were interested. Um, they submitted proposals and along with their proposal and along with the interview process, we basically rated them and we found uh, Bartland West to be um, obviously the, 
the most compatible to all our needs. And all our needs meaning every aspect of the water settlement. So that includes the CIP, that includes the uh, MRNI water distribution system, that includes the hydropower, and any expansion of future farms, any of that stuff, they've already done in the past. So all the things that um, they've done uh, historically and also their ability to bring us in to expand our technology to bring our irrigation system, our MRNI system into today's technology. So because they were able to do that, um, again, they were a perfect choice for us. So, so far we've established uh, three different, well, the master service agreement um, basically was an overall agreement that it didn't specify any um, work or dollars with it, but it was an individual agreement that we could establish task orders. So these task orders did, will have scope of work and engineering estimates along with it. So it gives us a little bit more uh, freedom to be project specific. So the three task orders that we've established so far under the CIP is the uh, general task order, which um, basically falls under any kind of general work that has to be done um, to you know, meetings to expand on the things that we need to do. Um, the CIP master plan was another task order, and uh, we're anticipating the master plan to be done in June. And uh, of course, the environmental assessment, uh, that again is another task order that we are working with uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, to get these things squared away. Um, another three that we've established for the MRI system Again, the general task order is just to pick up any general items that um, that they need to do. The MRI master plan that also is uh, completion date of June, and again the environmental assessment for that as well. So, um, in a sense, we are um, kind of in a, a low a low spot of our production. So. Uh, what we've done is, um, again, we've managed to keep a, a core crew that we can keep working through the construction season. And a lot of these guys um, that have kind of stuck with us since the beginning, we, we try to utilize them as our, as our basic crew and um, try to keep them on because they kind of went through the, um, you know, kind of went through the hard times with us basically. So we're glad that they stuck with us uh, even though there was other jobs out there that were paying more. So we wanted to kind of uh, um, help them out, congratulate them, and keep them on board because, you know, they did a lot of hard work. They worked through the winter months and <clears throat> um, stuck with us. So um, the, the last part that we just finished up with them on this past Friday was the uh, Bighorn High Check. And um, that's the last set of pictures that you see there. It's a big one high check. And, and uh, one of the things that I want to um, emphasize on, on this project is um, initially back in, uh, back in December, uh, we went, I went to a water users meeting with the previous director and they, um, they did not like water resources at all. And so the Bighorn High Check project was um, was actually an opportunity where we could actually help the water users. We could help BIA irrigation. Um, we could actually do the work for them at half the cost what they would have um, been able to get anybody else to do. And they only had forty thousand dollars to do to do this work with. And the last thing is, they, um, what well, we, if this project. Um, had not been done and this uh, structure collapsed, it would have cost us twice as much to uh, do the work later. So we not only saved ourselves money, we also saved uh, BIA irrigation money, and we we're able to help the water users. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, two weeks ago, went to the water users meeting, meeting and they actually, uh, the water users actually gave us a round of applause. So I thought that was a, a big step in the right direction. Um, there are a few other task orders that we are going to um, 
establish with Bartlett and West, and um, of course we were planning on keeping them for quite a while because they're um, capable of doing everything that we need. So uh, the first three are the GIS licensing and maintenance, uh, MRNI right away services, and CIP right away services. Now um, earlier I kind of mentioned that these guys are able to take us into the next generation of um, technology with uh, with our projects, and a lot of these. Um, we'll be utilizing uh, iPads and being able to do everything, a lot of these things remotely. So what used to take a lot of late work coming back, data input, all that kind of stuff, I mean, we're automatically sending that to the people in Bismarck that are, um, you know, turning this information around immediately for us so that we can get to construction sooner than what, what used to be done. The last two, the biological assessments for the two, um, again, that's just part of uh, part of the things that we need to complete in order to move on uh, rec reclamation requirements. So that's um, the projects that we've worked on pretty much in a nutshell and the projects that we're hoping to go through. Uh, I want to elaborate a little bit on, I guess, our staff, which is the last page. Um, as you can see, we've got 14 uh, office staff, two security, and 12 construction crew. And um, again, because we're going through the master plan um, phase and everything's kind of been slowing down, um, BOR has actually asked us to um, basically on a hiring freeze. So until we can uh, beef up our production, which probably won't happen until October again, um, they recommended that we no longer um, bring anybody on staff and tell them. But uh, there were a few uh, positions that had been, I guess we had been waiting to fill. Um, the, the last position was um, our finance, finance manager position. And we're able to, um, I guess as a, as a program, we're lucky to have somebody on board that what, what that does for us is it makes us more efficient. It allows a lot of the paperwork to be done in-house so that we alleviate some of the work that's actually done at the finance department. And we, I mean, of course we work closely with them. We're not outside of the tribe by any means, but we just alleviate some of the, I guess, the, the paperwork that needs to be done. So in turn, we're able to see where we are um, with our budgets, where we are with our construction costs. And <clears throat> so it's just a faster turnaround for us uh, to be able to um, stay in good standing with our vendors because we do um, utilize a lot of vendors for our materials. Uh, let's see. Um, our construction crew, again, um, these guys, you know, we weren't very competitive as far as our rates initially, and uh, again, they stuck us stuck with us through the the hard winter months, and you know, um, we decided that we're going to establish a, uh, a core crew, and with the help of uh, Chairman Old Kyle, we were able to to do that uh, last week. We made these twelve people are are basically our core crew. And they are now uh, permanent employees of the Water Resource Department that will actually work year-round. And <clears throat> even though I've said our irrigation season construction goes from October to April during the winter months, we do have MRNI that will be starting next summer. So we do have that core crew that will work off irrigation season, on irrigation season. So they'll end up working uh, full year-round. We've, uh, we've managed to um, work with our crews, uh, get, getting them the heavy equipment training that they need, getting them the, um, the needs for reading plans. Um, you know, so we've, we've put a lot of money into these guys, so we want to make sure we can keep them. Um, you know, we've had, last week we've had offers from North Dakota and Westmoreland offering them a lot more money. So in order to keep our rates competitive, 
uh, we have to make some adjustments that, again, the churn was able to help us out with, and VOR is, um, again, backing us on that aspect of it, so that, we, again, we put a lot of money into these guys, and we, we like to keep them. And they're the ones out there putting in the, the good work, and if you look at the pictures, you can see that they've done excellent work. So we have good core crew, and we definitely like to keep them. Uh, as far as our, uh, our staff, um, as the CEO mentioned earlier, um, we've been, you know, isolating our, um, our training on our, our staff, um, hoping to be a little more um, team-oriented, uh, working together and uh, work, making things work a, little, a lot smoother. Um, we've had our, we've got plans for our finance person to go get a little more um, training in our finance areas and along with our uh, water code. And um, again, we, we've got a good group of people and we'd like to keep them all. Turnover is the worst thing we can do. Um, just to elaborate on um, some of our um, budgeting, we have, since we started back in October 2011, we've had, for the CIP, we've had 18 drawdowns uh, at approximately 5.3 million. And our CIP, our current budget is uh, about 5.6 million with uh, approximately 2.3 carried over from the 2011-2012 budget. And the MR and I budget is actually in the middle of uh, being finalized, but um, up until now we've actually had four drawdowns of 174,000 approximately. So with that said, um, I'll cover uh, as much of the details as I have in front of me. Okay. The floor organizes Senator Stewart. <clears throat> I'm a speaker, secretary, members. I just want to have one, one question. Um, I know there's a requirement for an implementation committee for both the CIP and the MRNI. Who's on it? And when did they meet? And how can we how can we find out more about them? They're supposed to be in place. We we actually meet once a month, um, and there's a uh, flatbed, there's um, BI irrigation, Kyle or Bell, um, BOR's um, CIP engineer uh, Dan Stremka, and then the um, another guy with the BOR, which is um, I can't remember her exact title, but. Uh, Nancy Nelson, and then, um, and then of course me, and then the MR and I. We've got the same group of people, except for there's a BOR has got a MR, MR and I engineer that actually uh, comes into that one. So there are times where uh, Doug Olderman also attends, but for the most part, we meet um, the first Tuesday of each month, <coughs> and um, I think that was one of the meetings that we. Um, invited, invited. Uh, I can't remember if it was you or your group for the first meeting, and we also invited um, a few people at that time to see if we could get a few things, uh, get some people on the same page, update people to, to show exactly where we are. And since then, we've just condensed it to those five people again. But um, I mean, periodically, if you guys want to come join in. Um, maybe every other or every third meeting or something, if you guys want to uh, join us on that meeting, you're more than welcome to. So, uh, Senators, would you like for them to send us a notice for all Senators who are interested in sitting in on that meeting? Sure. Organize Senator Stewart. If I may, I, I'd like to have um, a notif notification being sent because I, you know, I, I kind of thought, you know, it would only make sense to have, um, an elected official from this branch to be on that because um, I don't know who made the selections but this is ours you know and we gotta we gotta make sure that you know we're represented in those areas and so 
you know, making sure that the MRNI, the CIP, everything's in place. You know, right now there's just so many things that are going on, you know, on, you know, that we're finding out. You know, first of all, you know, and Titus knows about this, you know, the Kalers are building bridges over the main canals in, in um, the, the Bighorn Valley. Who gives them that authority? You know, who does that? And they actually receive the timbers from from um, Bighorn County, but then Bighorn County says they have no obligation over it. Kalers say that they do. But I believe that 1904, that that was paid for with Crow dollars, that irrigation right away and whatnot. And I'm not talking about the, the one over at Birds, but I'm talking about further down, they just built one, you know. And when the issue on, on the um, reconstruction and, and, and reestablishing the bridge over at um, where Bird and Leaders live, at Soap Creek um, Canal, that one there called for a whole mess of people at the commissioners. You know, there was scads of people in that in that um, room, and I was the only one from the legislative branch in attendance. There was Rhodes, there was Bellings was there, everybody. Everybody didn't claim any kind of jurisdiction. Everybody said they didn't have it. But they're all going to come together, collaborate, an effort to redo that bridge because the farmers using it. And but when Kaler, when Dicky Kaler built a brand new bridge down the road over the same canal, nobody got together like the way they did when a crow asked them to redo that bridge. And so that was my concern, is why was there a double standard? And, you know, first of all, you know, to, you know, when you look at the history of this establishment of that canal, it was paid for and it was built by crows. And so now you got non-members just building bridges over it anywhere, any damn one place to really please, you know just so they get their cattle or their equipment over, over on the other side of it. But when we asked, shoot, there was about 30 people in that room. But when Kaler asked, or didn't even ask, he just built it. And Fenner even um, admitted, he said, yeah, we gave the timbers to Dickey. So they, they, they basically, Bighorn County supplied the the material and it, it, it didn't make no sense to me how um, according to the water compact we're supposed to have the control we're supposed to have these these areas of control but these um, farmers and ranchers are doing whatever they want and they got the assistance by um, Doug Greenwald at the time and I believe you know if, if any of you guys remember we've been in an ongoing war with that issue where the crows put in for to take over on those those areas and they were trying to kick all our crow irrigation guys out and a non-member comes on board and the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs your trustee gave all that money to a white guy to do all of that on your canal and so, you know, going back to this issue on the water compact, whether it gives us strength or whether, you know, whether it's that, if that's just tough, you know, if, if, we, if we do truly have the strength there, then we truly need to exercise it. Go ahead, yeah, response, go ahead. Uh, in response to that, um, you know, some of the different things that actually have, have gone on, um, you know, doing out the, the, the construction projects that are going on at this time, you notice different things that are going on when you're out there. So a lot of the things that I do see, um, I do let the BI irrigation, because right now they're still uncontrolled, I let them know, <clears throat> and you know, they've always had a response, but 
up till now, I mean, they're still responsible for everything that goes on in it. So there really isn't anything that I can do at this time until we get to that point where we actually do can take control. And when that does happen, I mean, again, part of what I mentioned earlier about uh, updating our um, irrigation technology, all of that will be able to um, analyze exactly how much flow is going to each assessed area. So <clears throat> a lot of these things that um, different landowners are doing, whether they're illegally taking water or illegally putting water back into the system, um, any of that kind of stuff you know, eventually can be tracked. But again, we're, you know, we're quite a few years away from establishing that kind of a system, but once we do get control and we get that system in, we'll be able to track it a lot better. Any more questions or comments? If not, okay, well, we thank you from the Water Resources Department. Mr. CEO, who is your next cabinet head? Next report will be given by Calvin Herrera, Natural Resources Cabinet Head. Hello, my, uh, my name is Calvin Herrera. I'm the cabinet head for natural resources. Uh, the natural resource office has uh, put together a, a emergency response operational plan and a communication plan and was given to Secretary Not Afraid and uh, I was uh, told that he was bringing it over here for the legislators to look at. Also, the resource, Natural Resource Office has put together the operational plan for the hairpin, uh, the hairpin ranch that was just purchased by the Crow Tribe. That was put together by my office and I think you have a copy of that, that plan. And by the request of the chairman, the Natural Resource Office is looking into the present MOA with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. After addressing all the concerns that the elected officials had, we had a meeting with the Bureau of Indian Affairs with all our concerns, and all of our concerns were addressed. And we walked away from that meeting uh, with the Bureau with all our, all our concerns were addressed, plus on the MOA, the tribe got a lot of, a lot of leeway on fires, emergencies, incidents on the Crow Reservation within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. We, as a tribe, tribal employees had to be terminated before they could go AD and fight fire for the tribe, uh, BIA. But in that meeting, we had the BIA to agree that the tribe will develop our own AD system. And they can go fight fire without being terminated on the tribal AD, AD system. On the emergency response team, that was developed my, by the request of the elected officials from my office with contribution from Hank's department, and other entities on the Crow Reservation, on the Crow Tribal Site, and on the Bureau. We, we developed that plan under the ICS system for span of control, and safety was our, our main concern.
the Natural Resource Office has put forth a budget for fiscal year 14 and an expenditure plan for the remaining six months. And that was turned into Secretary Notterfrey. All the departments in the Natural Resource have turned in a budget for the year 2014 into uh, Secretary Notterfrey's office and an expenditure plan for the next six months. The myself and the uh, director for the Buffalo Pasture went to Helena and met with the governor. Uh, we had concerns on some legislation that was being put forth in the Montana State Legislature. And we, we got to talk with the governor. And uh, one thing that was said by, in that meeting to the governor by an individual from another tribe was that it was the Native Americans that helped helped him get into office, and, and he agreed. And we are sure that uh, if it does pass the legislature, that it might might get vetoed. All of our, the Natural Resource Office, Fish and Game, Buffalo Pasture, uh, Culture, have put forth a position description, have completed position descriptions, and have turned them into the CEO's office. I'm still waiting on a couple of departments for their position descriptions. The Fish and Game Department under Natural Resources The Fish and Game Department is following Title 12 of the Fish and Game Code to the law in all Fish and Game matters. We have developed brochures we have distributed these brochures. Those brochures were developed <coughs> within the Fish and Game Department by the staff. The Fish and Game Department, Buffalo Pasture, has submitted several grants this past quarter and are closing down, are closing closing out other grants that were in place when the director and staff were hired. The Buffalo Pasture, the Buffalo Pasture Department is planning to harvest buffalo and distribute the meat to the districts like they used to do. On, on the, to the districts on the Crow Nation distribute meat to schools, elderly, senior citizens, centers, daycare, and other tribal related activities. That is our plan uh, for this season. Tribal lands have received X amount of dollars to purchase lands on the reservation. The director is working on this also, the Cobell Agreement, also working on this for <coughs> land purchase. The Director of uh, Tribal Lands is working on this. In our appraisal department, there has been eight appraisals completed, two inspected. This department is overwhelmed with requests and he's looking for a trainee to, to help lighten the workload. <coughs> A 
AML has submitted its grant for the 2014 fiscal year 2014 and will get $1.6 million. A percentage of the funds will go to the for the functions of the Crow AML and the remaining will go to education and other tribal cultural functions. The AML department has been certified complete, which means the AML program has completed all crow sites and will work on non coal public facility projects. The coal regulatory office has been working with coal companies on new coal deals with the Crow Nation. He also turned in a six months expenditure plan and a, and a uh, budget request for 2014. The TIPO office, <coughs> the TIPO office has a new director. <coughs> he has been working hard to bring the department in compliance with the Crow Nation policies and procedures also to follow regulations dealing with other entities. The director of TIPO was appointed to the board of directors for the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. He is the first Crow Nation tribal member to serve on the board. And I'm very proud of that individual. His name is Emerson Wolchief. <coughs> I'm proud of his accomplishments. The EPA department has a new director and is getting to know the system. The department is working on relocating the dam sites in Crow and, and Pryor. Cultural department is working on school presentations with the surrounding schools on and off the reservation. The department is also in consulting other departments with various culture related activities. I have a breakdown, a summary of the uh, 2014 budget, which I won't read because it will probably be presented to you uh, by, by the tribe elected officials. Thank you. Any questions or comments at this time? We'll organize Senator Kyle Bruns. Thank you, Speaker, Secretary Body. Uh, Calvin, uh, now what's the pressure of fishing game? I have a fishing game device with my own to make it more strict and harder for the, any entity to come in and infringe our rights. And, uh, our treaty rights law, they have been violated, you know, some damn many times. We can't cooperate with anything. And uh, now we're trying to get an MOA with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service pertaining to Eagle Parks and Raptors, but I, uh, like birds and whatnot. It's hard trying to work with these uh, individuals. They plan, they, they think they're above everybody else pertaining to our rights and they could as they are on the buffalo. Uh, what's the plan? Is there going to be uh, harvesting or selling? Okay, on the, on the fish and wildlife, I had a meeting with the supervisor for this district this morning. He said, there's, there's no way we can have an MOA. It's against regulations, but there's certain ways that we can work together with them and the uh, tribe. And we didn't go into detail, 
but there are ways that the tribe can work with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. But he said it's against re regulations to have an MOA, and I said let's have a cooperative agreement. And he said we cannot have an agreement. We can have an understanding. With that understanding in writing, we probably can work with the Fish and Wildlife, but we have to meet again so so we can go into further detail on that. Okay. And on the buffalo, the 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 buffalo pasture staff is developing developing a buffalo management plan. Okay? And when that plan is completed, it will be brought forth to this body, to you folks, and the chairman. Until such time uh, that a management plan is completed, uh, I, I, I'm not writing that, uh, so, uh, but I will contribute to the plan. Uh, I've written too many plans already and I'm burned out. But I will contribute to the plan, and uh, it will be brought forth in front of you folks, okay, on the buffalo. And uh, on, on, on our next meeting or the following meeting with the Fish and Wildlife Service, I will bring forth, I'll bring it forth to your your Natural Resource Committee, and if he request, if they request it, I will come before this body and give you a a rundown on it. Okay. The floor recognizes Senator Notafree of the Valley of the Chiefs District. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the body. It's always a pleasure, always uh, interesting to hear you speak on topics. Um, I heard you mention earlier that the tribe, in, the, in meeting with the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Forestry, the tribe is empowered to create their own AD system for firefighters. Now, with that said, will, will the regional office in Billings contact uh, the BIA for a fire call, or will they contact the tribe, or will they rotate that somehow? How, how's that gonna work, I guess? The system is in place. We as a tribe, uh, we have a lot of resources. Uh, I don't see us as a tribe wasting money <coughs> duplicating a system that's already in place. Uh, but they will contact the, the Bureau and the Bureau will contact us. And in that AD, the, our, the tribal AD system there will be a, a, a cost to each level, like the AD system with the, with the Bureau. See, the problem was, let me, let, let me go back a bit. They said they had a lot of complaints about tribal firefighters making a lot of money. They were making more money than the FMOs. They were making more money than the forest managers. <coughs> Uh, on a 14 days, uh, $17 an hour, I think it was $5,500, 14 day, 14 day trip with uh, uh, $17 an hour, I think it was uh, uh, 5,000 plus change, 5,500 plus change for tribal employees. And so they got a lot of complaints and then I, Looked at all of them, I said, when you go on fire, you go on fire, you go on fire, and you go on fire, those higher ups, those GS-12, 35, 40, $45 an hour. I said. Plus hazard. They get hazard and overtime. I said, does the tribe complain when you make all that money? They said, no. Why complain about the tribe? Tribal employees making money. And another thing that was agreed on, I'm glad you brought this up. We, as a tribe, 
can train our own employees and fire. Basic firefighting, refresher course, the lower level training, we as a tribe, we can do that. They gave us our approval yesterday. The regional office did. Not the local agency, the regional office did. See, all this stuff I'm telling you, the regional office agreed to do this. Not our local agency. And it's going to be in that MO, MOA. Uh, local, local agency, I don't know why, but the regional office agreed to all this. We can do all training, which they will reimburse the tribe. They give a fire number, a training number, up to a certain point. We just can't go out well. What concerned me, excuse me, what concerned me in that meeting was what was not in the MOA. What was in the MOA didn't concern me. What concerned me was what was not in the MOA. The tribe will furnish this, the tribe will do this, the tribe will do that. But there was nothing in that MOA that said the Bureau would do this, the Bureau would provide this, the Bureau would do this, the Bureau would do that. That wasn't in there. That's what concerned me. And we got to change. All right, thank you. We'll next we move to Senator Pat Alden. I have a quick comment. With due respect, Senator, I like uh, Duke, uh, he might want to come out of retirement, so keep us afloat on all AD programs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, Senator Alden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the body, guests, cabinet heads, uh, Secretary. It's not a, it's not a good, Butch going on fire here. We'll be here all day if we do, so uh, let me change the subject a little bit here. Um, uh, on the Title 12 Fish and Game Code, if that was one of our kind of our our goals and objectives on this, uh, something that we need to seriously revamp, and it's needed some update. So hopefully we can uh, working with our committee, Fish and Game Committee, and then our also with your uh, your department that we can come together and start start opening the back up. And I mean we need that that whole thing is needs to be revamped pretty much. So hopefully we can get that going. And then on that, um, we we made a law back in 2010 on uh, big orange sheep, and uh, it's it sits it's still sitting there. I mean, I, I don't know if you've got to look at it or not. It just so hopefully uh, take a look at it and see uh, when that can be implemented or what we can do about that, because uh, that was put in place because at one time there was uh, some some rams actually sitting over there on the on the uh, the uh, lake over there, and uh, people are killing them, killing them, and um, I know one used to sit in a uh, former chairman's office, and I mean, we didn't want that to happen, so we put that law in place, but I don't uh, know if it ever been followed up on, so just kind of heads up on those. On the 2012, <coughs> we're going to use it as a foundation. It, it's there. So we enact to it, Improve it, but it's a good foundation. It really is. Uh, so we will, we will meet with the the Fish and Game Commission, and if I'm not here or the director's not here, we will send a representative, the individual that's uh, looking into the code, and looking into the Fish and Game Code for uh, Title 12. Uh, so we will be in touch with you guys. And we will want. To, we do want to work with you. Uh, with that. All right. Uh, next, for organizing.